Online Miami was one of my favorite games of all time, and it's a game developed by two guys and a game maker engine. While I did have a few issues and nitpicks with it, I still didn't let it get too much in the way of my overall experience, because it offered so much for just a small game. I wouldn't get bored of it if I played it for a week, let alone for as long as a month if I wanted to. With that being said, the next thing for me is to look into its sequel, Hotline Miami 2 Wrong Number. When it comes to sequels, most people are concerned with how they turn out by the time they launch. Some sequels manage to take things into a new direction without ruining any of the predecessor's work. Some try to expand on what they've already built on, and other times they barely change that much, despite following after the previous game. I've never reviewed through a game franchise before, so in this video, we'll not only look at how the game stood after 5 years, but also what kind of sequel it falls into. This is the critique for Hotline Miami 2 Wrong Number. The controls are pretty much the same as the first game, with a few new additions depending on the character and mask you choose for specific levels. We'll get to some of the details later for the playable mask characters, but the rest of the characters we play as are just pretty good at combat without one. Regardless, each character has a unique ability to make them more varied than just the bare minimum. Just like the first game, there's a good amount of replayability with this one to keep coming back for more albeit some of them have been tweaked in different ways. Aside from the camping that takes a little bit above the same playtime as the first one, you can redo it with the hard difficulty for some extra challenge, which we'll get into later. In addition, you have some unlocks to have longer and more levels than before, as well as more characters. The scoring system is pretty much a staple for the series, so that is returned mostly the same, especially with the grading of your performance. However, the system for this game no longer uses the playstyle type that you'd see along with the letter grade in the second screen. Instead, the entire grading is done within one single screen and you also don't get to see what each move you do adds up to the total score. Your score also doesn't reward you with any extra unlockables either because they are usually just for progressing through the campaign. Another interesting addition is the fact that you have some amount of playing around with choices and consequences. Now you already know how much your boy loves to talk about this whenever a game brings it up and doesn't execute them right like Telltale. This is somewhat better but they only change certain things that result from your choices despite following the same narrative path. In the level withdrawal, Jake ends up being shot in the head whether or not he manages to survive the last part of this scene but it plays out in different locations and scenarios based on that. If you get killed no matter what, the bodyguards of the Russian mob will drag Jake to Petrov and kill him after he has already pleaded to spare him. If you stay alive after killing everyone, the 50 blessings manager will come right up in a van and drive Jake to some office building. While the manager leaves as if he were to grab a cup of coffee, he grabs his gun instead and kills Jake to avoid him from spilling the details to the public. Within that same ending of the scene, you can also make another choice on whether to grab the disc, which unlocks a level called the Abyss. You can also unlock a different ending for the mission subway if you pick up the telephone at Evan's home, which will give you more information about what happened to Biker since the first game's ending. While the choices and consequences don't really span throughout the entire playthrough, it at least makes certain part of it different, which is at least better than reusing dialogue and actions even without following the same path. Finally, you have a bunch of achievements for more replayability in the same sense as how the first game wanted you to, but it also encourages you to achieve certain achievements from playing the hard mode too. The game doesn't use a lot of masks, but instead you play as different characters like the fans, Detective Pardo, Evan Wright, the son and his bodyguard, as well as the beard himself. Hotline Miami 1 just gave you masks that had their own ability, but you could also just play with the weapons you'd find around and do executions regardless. 
With this game, there's a perk and a cost for each character that you play as to make things more varied. And we'll start by going back to the fans. You get to play with a few new masks, aside from Tony using a worn out tiger mask. But we'll get back to Tony in a minute. The new character is Mark, who can dual wield his default machine guns until they run out. Then we have Cory who can do a roll dive to avoid getting damage for a second, but you have to time it right or you'll get killed even while rolling. And the last character is actually a duo of Alex and Ash as geese, who play like brothers a tale of two sons, except that one of the siblings has a chainsaw and the other just covers for him. Tony is a familiar mask like I said so, but he also has a new addition which is that he can only use his fists and is unable to pick up weapons. Looking at the unmasked characters, we have Detective Danny Pardo, who is a good shotgunner. Beard can use a knife while wielding any gun regardless, as well as stock up on ammo with crates around the levels. The Russian mob leader's son can choose certain weapons that each function like most of the fans. Evan Wright can knock enemies out or kill them if you choose to do so, and the pig butcher Martin Brown is slow but strong. There are also a few more playable characters, but they have very little to differ from each other. The great thing about this character playstyle system is the fact that not only does it offer actual characters rather than just cosmetics, but you can also choose one of a few weapons offered for certain characters before playing as them. For the non-masked characters, I like to place the sun with a katana because he can also roll dodge while slashing around. And Beard's pretty OP with the flamethrower, albeit needs to reload a bit more. As for the masked characters, I enjoy playing around with Jake wearing the Dallas mask because it makes me feel like if Chia from Persona 4 was actually a badass tornado. I do like playing the rest of the characters regardless, but there are some things I don't like about how they're designed. Firstly, Mark is designed like he has a short burst of dual wielding adrenaline that follows on with playing the rest of the game as an average character. I'm not suggesting that he should have gone with a different weapon or playstyle because I actually like the dual wielding aspect of him. But the fact that his ability runs off right after the starting weapons lose ammo makes him immediately not that fun anymore. It would have been better if he could continue dual wielding with any firearm that can work like dual pistols, maybe something akin to Beard's playstyle or even dual wield two handed melee weapons to be strong enough. And the other thing is that you can't replay most of the levels with any other character because they're designed for specific characters in mind. This is more of a criticism with the level design, but from the point of characters, it makes replayability for them really difficult because you don't get to test levels with playstyles that, while they don't fit for it, might still be fun to try out anyway. The first game was enjoyable without the need of an extra difficulty, but with the sequel, it decided to amp it up a bit by including a hard mode. When it comes to the normal mode, it has about the same difficulty in terms of the enemies from the previous game, but with the additional enemies that have slightly more improved AI and levels designed for characters, it pushes things a little bit further. The game is so far enjoyable on its normal mode, but how does the extra mode take things up a notch? Basically, uh, the difficulty flips the levels upside down, literally. Aside from that, the levels have a different enemy placement to make things feel more challenging and also add some more enemies in different parts of the level, as well as have a more responsive AI than before. Along with that, an S rank is added to the letter grades, and loaded firearms will lose a portion of their ammo each time you pick it up. From playing through most of the game in hard mode, I'd say that it's not quite difficult to get an S rank from a, for a good amount of the levels, at least if you are able to beat them fast and have good combo chains too, but the larger levels will make it very difficult to beat it unless you play through without dying too much. But that doesn't mean it isn't worth trying, so I'd suggest you do so when you want to replay the game. With around 30 levels, it adds a lot more variety in terms of the playstyle and also the location set. Some levels take place in the Hawaii flashback segments, some have you play in buildings similar to the first game because they take place at that time, and others are just new interior levels that have some really different locations. They are also designed as per the characters, which I have mentioned before so it's not just generic for the average playstyle. 
There's a bonus level that can be unlocked based on whether you make a choice to find a certain item, so that kinda satisfied my curiosity for secret areas, but you can only find one. Pretty much every level is necessary for the story, so there's no level that's fun in the same way as the first game's bonus levels. But they're still worth playing through regardless, because it never feels boring doing most of them over and over. The only few scenes that are kinda tedious is Deadhead and Release. But I guess it's more because they're difficult and have many levels to go through. It's a bit of a double-edged sword because they do make the most of the difficulty and variety in pacing, but end up taking too much time for losing if you don't know how to beat it. The missions are pretty much designed as the first game standard, so I won't repeat too much on how you go about it. Although they play out a bit differently depending on who you play as because of when they take place, and also what kind of purpose each mission are within their story. You get a few boss battles here and there, like the ones from release, fight in a war during the Hawaii flashbacks, apocalypse puts you into a drug race rush, and so much more. The first game had a good lot of enemies, but some of them were more unique one-off appearances than the rest. With this game, it adds some more new enemies that are both recurring and level exclusive ones. And we'll start off with the recurring ones. The first new addition are the Colombians, a different mob faction that have a few similar enemy types to the Russians, but also have a new one we'll call as Slashers. Those guys can be hit with gunfire because they move pretty quick, so you'll have to use a melee weapon against them. Then there's the police guards, which aren't quite a unique faction, but the inspectors in this game drop a taser when you kill them and you can actually use those to stun enemies with it. And finally, we have some gangster crooks who work under some higher ups, but also don't have much going for it. Now, moving on to the special NPCs, we have quite a handful to look into. The first being prisoners, who are exclusive to the level release, but can also be a pickle to deal with sometimes. While most of the prisoners act like regular crooks, there are cycle prisoners that will run up to you really fast and can also dodge gunfire like slashers. In the scene Apocalypse, the NPCs are all demons except for the Russian mobster's son because of the new drugs, but they don't do anything new apart from that. There's still a couple more enemies than the ones I mentioned, but I won't go through them too much. What I will say is that the variety of enemies does make you focus more on strategy than before, especially on hard mode and even makes you use more weapons and styles to fight against them. Finally, let's talk about the level editor, which is quite an interesting feature and is more convenient than using Game Maker, since it's included in the game. While I've never made a mod or project for a game, I decided to give it a shot for the sake of this video, even if it sucks as hard as building a Jenga tower out of bowling pins. The level editor lets you either create a single scene or an entire campaign. But for this video's purpose, we're just gonna stick with a scene, even if it's not a fully fleshed one. It should just be enough to test out the level editor, which is fine. Creating a new level will greet you with a setup screen for naming the level and choosing the character you want to play as, along with picking a music track to fit with it. When you choose a character, there are some enemies that they're limited interacting with, which kinda makes it feel a little restricting, but the different factions are pretty similar anyway. Once you're done with the setup, then you're free to play around with the tools and make a level out of them. I kinda found it a bit confusing at first, but looking at some of the guides and getting myself familiar with the controls made it easier to work with the level editor. Some of the interesting features I found were changing the background or adding some climate options, even though I didn't actually change them for this test level. I encountered a bit of bugs here and there from my test playthroughs which took a while for me to fix mostly because of my design. But eventually it ended up being a pretty good level for the first time. Once you're done with it, you can go ahead and make a VHS cover to add some nice polish to it. Alright, now that I'm done with it, here's a full playthrough of the final level.
From my experience as a level editor, it was a decent time, but I do have some criticisms about it. And no, it's not about bugs or anything game breaking. For one, I do enjoy the tracks from this game, but I wish you could add tracks from the previous game as well, because those were also great to listen to and also play through. I guess this might be an issue with copyright licenses, similarly with trying to make custom levels use any music. But it would have been nice to use some of the soundtrack from the first game anyway, especially if you're trying to recreate a level from that. Another point I want to bring up is that the level editor screen is way too small to work with, at least with my monitor. I've read that lowering the resolution helps, but two much simpler solutions are to either include a zoom slider to adjust the view close or far enough, or just make the normal size of the editor the same as a level would look. As for making a campaign, let alone an actual level, I'm thinking of either streaming the entire development process, or just making it in my own time and promoting it on the channel when it's nearly done. Let me know what you think about that in the comments below if you're interested. The sequel tops the first game with more than it already offers, with the addition of a tougher difficulty mode, new enemies and weapons, more levels and playable characters, and everything else done to add replayability and challenge. The only issues I had were that replaying this game for certain levels can tank if they take a really long time to beat and some levels on hard mode aren't actually that hard for a first playthrough. Other than that, it's still worth playing most of the time. The sequel expands on the story in more ways than you think. Hotline Miami 2 isn't just set after the events from the first game, but it's also set before and even during the first game, as if it's going back and forth constantly like a non-linear story. It's a very difficult one to summarize because it changes between different storylines too, but I'll try to do what I can. The first thing we see in the game is a prologue titled as Midnight Animal, a fictitious movie that is inspired by Jacket's Rampage. But instead we play as a pig masked man named Martin Brown, who breaks in an apartment and assaults a woman by the end before being interrupted by the director of this fictitious movie and calls everyone to take a break. The real story begins in Act 1 Exposition, which takes place after the first game on the Halloween night of 1991. In the first scene, you play as the fans, a masked gang who planned to make it big like Jacket did and take out some thug before ending the night with a pizza party that they still have to pay for. The next scene introduces Detective Manny Pardo, who is first seen at a diner on his way to a supermarket robbed by the Russians, and wipes them all out before the police respond. He leaves out of the supermarket to investigate a crime scene related to a new criminal called the Miami Mutilator. Following after that, this scene rewinds back to 1989, the year of the first game. And our next protagonist is a thick boy named Jake, who gets a call from 50 Blessings but he wants to know who's behind the phone calls before driving off to the location. He ends the night with an attempt to draw a new tattoo celebrating his victory but is unable to do it on the same day because of the tattoo parlor schedule. The final scene starts off with a dream sequence taking place in a talk show with Martin Brown discussing the controversy behind Midnight Animal but it breaks apart when he loses control and murders the room. And the hallucination of Richard appears before him to warn Martin about the girlfriend ratting on him and running away. Martin gets arrested at the doorstep of his apartment and is interrogated about his crimes, but he starts hallucinating a ringing telephone that commands him to go on another rampage at the police department and ends up getting killed by the girlfriend. This ended up as another scene filmed for Midnight Animal but the death ended up being real. Act 2 Rising takes place around 1991 for the entirety and starts off with the court hearing of Jacket's murders. And this scene's protagonist named Evan Wright is attending it as part of his book on the mass killer phenomenon and to find out the truth behind it. He heads up to the golden truck stop to ask the leader about the mass group and meets up with Pardo for a drink before returning home. 
The following scene starts with the fans yet again who are planning to rescue Jack's sister from a wasted street, who ends up shocked that he murdered everyone in the level and refused to return back with them. This next scene starts off with the henchman of the Russian Mafia, who decides to retire after taking care of a few errands. Before he leaves, the Russian father's son gives him some drugs as a parting gift and heads home to surprise his girlfriend with the money he got. He dreams of finally being free since he no longer works for the Mafia, but Richard interrupts his peace and asks about his girlfriend's whereabouts as well as the money. The final scene begins with the henchman trying to call both the girlfriend and his boss while he's high from the drugs and gets a visit from the masked gang who kill him with a brutal beating. The third act climax begins with the introduction of Beard as a playable character, but his scene is set during 1985 in a war with the Russians in Hawaii. Not much happens apart from giving a few details about Jacket and Beard's friendship and shows the fans origins as well. Going back to the present for the next scene, the fans try to cause more controversy by killing some lowlifes that sold weed to Cory, but end up just getting the weed stash and nothing more. Meanwhile, Detective Pardo drives up to Alex's place looking for Ash, but he's nowhere to be seen. He then leaves to empty out a Colombian freight ship before heading off to another Miami mutilator crime scene. And in the final scene of the act, the fans group up once again and take on the Russian mob after retrieving the henchman's cell phone, only to end up dead by the son's hands and Pardo after he catches Tony surrendering. The following act falling starts with Evan on his way to talk with Richter's mom about her son, but finds that his family left home after he wakes up. He then takes the subway and experiences some hallucinations of his wife looking down on his career and gets in the middle of a fight with the entire subway gang before sending Richter's mother his number for the man himself. The following scene goes back to the Hawaii flashbacks yet again, but Beard is about to leave back home from the war with a supposedly final mission to infiltrate a stronghold. The scene afterwards begins with Jake leaving to visit the 50 Blessings and thinks that their operations haven't implemented the phone calls yet, despite getting the same phone calls. He then continues to his location, and depending on how he survives in the mission, Jake gets shot by either Petrov or the 50 Blessings manager himself. The scene then ends right after that with Evan inspecting Jake's costume and unable to find anything of worth, but which might also end differently depending on what happened during that scene with the manager. The scene rewinds back to the Hawaii flashbacks with Beard for the last time when his unit has to try and capture a nuclear power plant despite being outnumbered by the Soviet troops in the location. Once they manage to wipe everyone out, they get to the control room where the Soviet general self-destructs the plant before killing himself. As the unit tried to make it out, Barnes and Daniels gets risked in the explosion while Beard carries Jacket out because he was injured and they both make it out to the light of the underground tunnel. The ending then fast forwards to the same time as the first game with Beard working at the convenience store and stepping outside for a bit only to get wiped out by a nuclear bomb. The penultimate act intermission starts off with Ritker calling Evan about his talk with his mother and wants Evan to buy a plane ticket for her in return for sharing his story on the 50 blessings who he initially ignored for a bit until his car was wrecked as a threat and reluctantly answers to them. His first mission since then was to empty out the Russian bar and returns home to watch over his sick mother. The next mission was another order of the 50 blessings, but after returning home he finds his mother passed out in the bathroom due to her condition and carries her back to the bed. The scene after that just carries on with nothing that's really important to the story other than just following the order again and the final mission we play as Richter takes place in prison after he gets arrested for everything including murdering Jacket's ex. He gets visited by the two janitors from the first game and although he has no clue who they are, the two bid farewell with him and he's taken to the prison yard's basketball court for a surprise. This ended up being a boss fight with a burly bearded inmate. After Ritker kills him, he runs back into the prison to wipe out the rest of the inmates and wards before being escorted by the SWAT team. We return to the present when Ritker explains the reasoning behind the plane ticket to Hawaii, 
and Evan agrees to help out with it. The scene ends with an ultimatum that will be revealed in the game's ending, which has resulted from Evan either choosing to call back his family or carry on with finishing the book. The final act starts off with the mob leader's son planning to take out the Colombians, starting with their club. When he gets back from the club, he celebrates with the drug and women they salvage from it, while his loyal henchman decided to go home to his girlfriend. The following scene afterwards, the son plans a bank heist with his cronies, but after breaking into the vault, he hallucinates a conversation with his family and the bodyguard girl, and later sees his grandfather talking down on him with a Richard mask. This next scene is where we last play as Detective Pardo, who visits yet another Miami mutilator scene before going back home, but later wakes up in a nightmare where his revolver has been stolen by a dummy followed by being directed into another fake movie scene where he's revealed to be the Miami Mutilator and gets killed by the cops at the door of the department. Pardo then wakes up from the nightmare and decides to stay at home despite the department calling him for something important. The final scene in the act gets us back to playing as the son who is planning to kill the Colombian leader to take over their location and successfully pulls off the job with the rest of his gang. This is where the final level of the game completes the story and appears to be around the same time as the scene Death Wish, making this the last date of the game. While everyone is celebrating the takeover with some arcade gaming and what have you, the son decides to pop in a couple of pills they made recently for a test and loses control after an overdose. His extremely high state causes him to go on a massacre killing his own henchmen and all the fans that didn't make it out of the building before walking off the rooftop onto a rainbow road which could be an interpretation of him accidentally committing suicide and then rolling in the credits. Now the first game gave a twist right after the credits with an extra chapter playing as the biker which was unexpected but still worth it. So now you must be expecting yet another epilogue act after the credits right? Where it just ends with everyone getting nuked? Oh well, uh, I guess that's where the story really ends. If you want to replay the game, there are a few changes depending on your choices. The first new change is an additional cutscene with Richard gathering all the people who died in the game's ending or got killed during the campaign. Then there's the unlockable scene, the abyss, which just gives a nudge on what happened to the remaining masks from the first game, as well as lead Evan into an address that he found in Jake's floppy disk. When I first played Hotline Miami, I felt the story didn't hit me until later down the playthrough, but this game had a whole new level of confusion, at least for the first playthrough and maybe a little bit on the second. I guess it was a new thing to see this next game be drastically expanded upon just only a few years later, but it took me a lot longer to finally get it, at least most of it. The first game tried to go simple and straightforward with their plot but also had some depth at the same time thanks to the story's themes and messages. And a lot of the characters that were present there were also used as metaphors too. But for the second game, the Denethan team decided to take a new direction with their plot as a cinematic experience which played around with fleshing the lore from the first game as well as looked into Jacket's consequences with everyone involved. In the Hawaii flashbacks, they gave us a reason to Beard and Jacket's friendship aside from Jacket's hallucinations after the 50 blessing jobs. It also introduced us to the fans and how they were so skilled in the present day events of the game. The other flashbacks of the first game's event let us see what Ritker was going through and why he had to kill Jacket's ex so that he could protect his sick mother from the 50 blessings. Moving further in time, the majority of the game develops the fans even further and are motivated by Jacket's controversy to make it just as big as he did, only to end up dying nowhere close to their goal. Along with that, the mobster's son tries to take over the Colombian so that he can avenge his deceased father and make him feel proud for finishing the job. Evan Wright had an interesting storyline where he had to depend on his life for finishing the book, even had to risk his family depending on if he choose to do so. I also found the son's henchman storyline intriguing because it showed that despite working for the Russians, not everyone under the faction wants to carry on murdering for too long. 
and Manny Pardo struggled with gaining attention as the Miami murder was short but still worth a ride. So my original opinion was that the story was messy and too complex for the game, but that's probably because it was written like a Tarantino film and I've never seen one of those until like sometime this year. So looking at the story again in terms of that style, I can see it somewhat better because I did like how everything converges from different starting points towards the end, like the fans and the sun storylines. I do still think that jumping from the first game to this felt completely different and a little bit uncomfortable at times, but I've started to appreciate the story a bit more. Apart from that, I've also recognized what the themes and messages of this game are. While the first dealt with our opinions on violence, the sequel takes it a little further and shows us the impact and origins of said violence. It showed us the choices and consequences like how the fans and Manny struggled to get attention while Jacket swooped in a few times and made it. The game's uses of making choices in gameplay is also interesting and while I've originally thought their impact would make a lot more changes to the story, I understand that it would be too much to handle for just their second and final game in the series. With what they offered though, it still gives us some cool story pieces like when unlocking the abyss level or answering the telephone in the beginning of Subway. To sum up, Hotline Miami 2 built up quite some confidence to take a step up with the narrative and I think it paid off decently. I still get confused a bit because it's a different storytelling method unlike the first game but taking the time to reflect upon it a lot helped it much better. The game's graphics doesn't go any further with the pixel art style, but it still looks great as it is, so I don't mind it all that much. Some of the changes so far are the cutscene sprites when a character is talking, which now has a facial animation with or without a mask, and also some new execution animations with even more gore. Other than that, the levels look so much more unique in terms of the layout and the color scheme, and the UI has a different placement, as well as the graphic design itself. But in terms of outside the level, the menu displays the scenes with a VHS tape cover instead of a map layout for the main missions. Each VHS cover were made as if every scene is a movie in and of itself. Speaking of covers, let's get into a look at the cover art for this game. Looking at it, the cover screams nuclear explosion with the fans burning, and Beard watching the city crumble before his eyes. Now it may look like it spoiled the ending, but for one thing, Beard died in the San Francisco bombing and not in Miami. The background also doesn't really spoil anything because the fans were killed by the sun and not by the ending's nuclear wipeout. The whole poster isn't saying what's actually happening in the game, but it's more of a message to the players about marking the series ending. When it comes to my thoughts on it, I think it's a pretty good cover art. It's got some warm, colorful palettes there. Although I do feel like having Beard just stand there staring back at the viewer looks a bit like every AAA game cover art. But I think it kinda needs that because it's showing characters like Beard watching his dead unfold in front of him, similar to how it was in the ending. Aside from that, there's a limited physical edition of the collection from the Nintendo Switch but the cover for it is basically just combining the two games top and bottom with a banner. It looks fine, but it's got nothing that I haven't said before. In terms of artistic preference, I'd go with the Japanese Collector Editions cover art over this one because of its unique artwork and color scheme. I do think that the Switch's cover art is good enough to be considered a marketable video game cover art, but it just kinda looks lazy aside from the title. With that being said, I still like most of the cover art we've seen in this game and I think the sequel's cover art is one of the best if not the definitive best of them all. Much like the first game, the soundtrack for this one has a good amount of synthwave tracks but also has some other types of electronic music mixed in between and despite that it still kinda fits in because it's more of a 90s kind of vibe game than the 80s. The soundtrack also has a large amount of licensed tracks from a lot of the musicians we already know from the first game, 
but also brings in some new ones, be it recognizable or not. Aside from El Huervo, the various artists range from Jasper Byrne, to Moon, Scaddle, and Perturbator. Their tracks were mostly well done as always, with the likes of El Huervo's tracks that all sound like very relaxing lo-fi songs, but still fit with the game's Hawaii cutscenes. Perturbator nails the adrenaline fuel vibes on his score. And Skettle kind of takes things slow but still lets the gameplay flow in its own pace. However, the soundtrack is mostly improved with the addition of some other big synthwave names like Carpenter Brute. Mega Drive. Magic Sword and Mitch Murder. There's some of them that aren't really good for synthwave, but have an electronic blend fitting for the levels. Like El Tigre's track, she swallowed burning coals for the scene seizure. Light Club's track, Fakit. For apocalypse. And I'm the kid, you know what I mean, track Run for Subway. From out of these three, I like Light Cup's track more because it feels like a psychedelic rampage as I'm playing Apocalypse. Then there are those like Endless or Life Companions who make some creepy tracks as her doing the nightmares with Richard. or in the scene itself, Into the Pit. Magnus track Divide feels like an action movie track, which fits for the scene Hard News.
An old Future Fox gang makes some pretty good ambient tracks to the investigation and Hawaii cutscenes. Now, as much as I'd like to keep going on about each track and artist, there's just too many of them to summarize, so I'll say that I enjoyed most of them. Almost much better than the first game soundtrack. Because of the large number of tracks, it makes very little room for repetitive tracks, and there's only like 2 of them out of all the 49 used. If you get the digital special edition, you get some extra tracks that are remixes of the original ones done by the big three that is Carpenter Brute, Moon, and Scattle, and those remixes are all great. Now there's not much to dislike, but I could bring up that more the tracks do back to back with that small break in between again. Some of them all still can go on for a long time without having that silent gap, but it still has that issue again. Other than that, I still enjoy what they had to offer. On the other hand, the sound effects are made just as about the same level as before, but this time it's far less reused with some characters. There are some new sound effects corresponding to their weapons or acids, and they also sound just as good, like Alex's chainsaw tearing through his victims, or the flamethrower torching the Russians in Hawaii. Other than that, it's all done as it was before. While the music is slightly different to the first game's tone, they still fit the levels they're used in, and the sound effects still work like a charm in making that same impact. Just like with the first game, Hotline Miami 2 Wrong Number gives me quite a lot of reasons to keep coming back for more. Although the level designs are not executed well, I still think it's worth replaying because the game offered more action packed gameplay with some new features and characters, an interesting story that built a strong level of lore into the series, and had a good variety of music that fit for each level. But while both of the games are great in their own ways, I feel like the first game is so much better despite the smaller scale. For one, the high scores have more of an incentive rather than just to compete on the leaderboard. And I also like the story that was very simple but still had an interpretive nature. The story for the second game had some interesting part, but as a whole I prefer the first game more in terms of clarity. Despite my criticisms, I will say that I respect the Denethan duo's vision with these games. Jonathan and Dennis started the series as just some project they wanted to make for themselves, but resulted in blowing up further than they expected. And they ended up with a sequel that, while not liked by some people, they still stand by it no matter what. You don't hear that often with a lot of game developers. Most of them keep making the franchise either because of the attention or money alone. But these guys just want to make games that they'd enjoy playing first while still offering a decent experience for everyone else. I'm glad that they're honest with their focus in making these games, and I'm excited to see what their next project will be, even if it's nowhere similar to the Hotline Miami games. Thanks again to those who watched the video throughout the end, especially for the long ass summary one. Uh, if you guys enjoyed the video, give a like and show your support through it, and if not, you can comment down below and let me know what you think of it what needs to be criticized and such. Uh, this video took quite a long time to make, much longer than I expected it to be out, and that was mostly because of stuff related to the video that I last uploaded, as well as some other stuff that happened outside the channel. If you guys are expecting something for the next video, I'm not really sure what to plan, and it might not also come out until like maybe a couple months from now. Nothing related to my work process, it's just that I'm going to be taking some time off YouTube. I did mention this before in my last channel update, so you can check there for more information. But just to keep things short, um, it's just so I can focus on my future. 
that's about it. I will say that my next video might be a review or it might be another video essay that I did like this video. But uh, not gonna have anyone collaborating with it so don't be too excited about it. But if you guys want to still stay updated on what's going on with me outside of the channel and whatnot, feel free to jump into the Discord server. I'm kind of active there so feel free to check out and wait until like I announce something. Alright, well that's about it for today. I don't know if I'll ever be going on for too long but I hope to see you again when I come back. Until then, enjoy your day and I hope you can still stick around until I come back. Alright, see you until the next one.